Well, hey, I'm excited today to kick off a new series. My name's Don, if we haven't had the chance to meet yet. And uh, if you're newer to Highmark, uh, let me just say welcome home. We're so glad that you're with us today, worshiping with us. And uh, we're expectant. And man, wasn't like the presence of God during worship just in this place. I love our, our worship team, the heart they have to lead us. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I was feeling it today. Like, uh, and I appreciate the heart that JD and the team bring as they come in early. They, get, they prepare this place for worship. And we're just in week three of this new location. And uh, we're, we're still figuring out all the all the the parts of the building and like and what it's like to have a permanent home and not have to pack up church every week and load it into a 24 foot trailer actually two 24 foot trailers uh and so uh we're grateful but excited and as you heard we got a lot of work to do around this place to make it feel like home uh we got a lot of painting to do a lot of prep and we want to get a lot of that done by Easter. So uh, you'll just hear more about that as you saw and heard in the announcements this week. Today we're kicking off a new series just called Money Talks. This is a really short series. Normally our, our, our series are like four weeks. This one we're just doing two weeks. And uh, I'm excited about this. This is something we talk about every year. We focus on every year. We just take a couple weeks to talk about... Uh, finances and our personal finances and God's perspective when it comes to money. Now, I know there's probably like a, a little bit of nervousness, maybe. There's maybe like, ooh, I showed up on the money week at church. Like, ooh, okay. Like, I should have watched the social media a little better this week and chose a different week to come to church. Um, but let me tell you, Highmark's not like that. We uh, don't talk about it uh, in depth or manipulate or try to twist arms. Uh, we really just talk about it because it's the full counsel of God's word. Like, it's in God's word. We teach and preach the whole uh, the whole Bible. And so it's something that we look at. It's something that's important for us to understand God's perspective of finances. And that's why we look at it. But money talks, don't you know? Have you ever been in a situation where you saw that money talks? Like it makes things move and makes things happen. I was on a global team a few years ago, like serving. I've been to many countries serving and and uh, like doing missions and partnering with missionaries that are in country. And I was on a global team to Fiji. Now, how many people would love to go on a mission trip to Fiji? You're like, okay, see, now you guys are getting on board with this. And I remember uh, being on that trip and we were there serving the community because uh, a, a uh, hurricane had come through. They actually, it's in the Southern hemisphere. They call them a cyclone, little education for you today. Uh, they call them a cyclone because they spin the opposite direction. Um, and maybe the toilets flush the opposite direction in the su Southern hemisphere as well, but I don't know. Uh, I don't know. That's not in my notes. I didn't plan on saying that. It just happens. So, uh, but I remember like uh, we're there and we're serving and uh, we're there. A cyclone had come through and we're trying to get supplies and uh, help people in need that had their homes devastated and flooded and and we're trying to meet the needs. And one of our partners, Convoy of Hope, is already uh, had already sent supplies and had. Uh, uh, water and drinking water available and we just needed to get it where it needed to go and we had contracted and had a, a, a delivery plan uh, to this one community so we could distribute as much water as uh, people needed and I remember that the delivery company like we're ready the day of to do it and the delivery company that was going to truck the water out they just said you know what we can't do it like we don't want to drive out that far this you know big disaster just happened they were really hesitant so uh, our, our partner in country there that lives there and serves uh, him and I jumped in a truck and we went into town where the delivery company was where the warehouse was that the water was stored in and uh, let me tell you I found out I could make money, like I could use money because it talks in that situation. We were talking with the driver, he was real apprehensive, and I just talked to our, our missionary there. I said, hey, if we gave him a little extra, like if we gave him a little tip, would he, would he deliver it? And he's like, well, I don't know, we can try. So I said, okay, let's do it. I got, I got some pocket cash here. Our team is wanting to make a difference. And so I, I just, I simply, I just said, okay, like ask him, like say, hey, if we can sweeten the deal a little bit, will he do it? And let me tell you, money talks. That guy had that water out. He, he pushed all his other deliveries aside and he gave us the priority and delivered our water so we could help that community, help those people in need. Money talks. 
talks. It moves things along. Some people might say that's a bribe. I just said it's a tip, like it's a blessing of the Lord. That's the way I looked at it. I was like, hey, I'm an American. I can uh, thank Fiji for all their great water they bring to Amer- they send to America, and I just want to bless these people. Uh, but money uh, has a tremendous power in our life, right? It has a tremendous uh, uh, control of us. We probably, even as I was talking about it, maybe you're a little apprehensive because you're like, oh, money, it's like sensitive. Like it can be something that we, uh, we don't want to get into or we don't want to discuss or we feel like it's a more of a private matter. But the Bible talks at great length about money. I think it talks at great length about money because it, it, it connects what's internal to the external. It's one way that what's in our heart kind of becomes evident to people around us. Have you noticed that? Like there's people in our world and in our lives and, and sometimes like you see their heart, they are really into cars, right? They're really into cars. I love cars too. I love like uh, seeing the cool cars that come out, Ford Broncos and you know, like I am pumped for that. I probably won't own one, but I'm pumped for that. Like I'm into that. And so you see sometimes, but uh, maybe their, their, their heart is... Uh, tied to their home and where they live and and you can just they were blessed to live in a community where where we have a great quality of life so money can kind of take what's internal and it and it kind of shows it more externally and the, the this year I know that there's a lot of realities when it's come to money and COVID and people's income and their stability and things have felt a little more shaky and you know, like, I don't know what's going to happen. And I remember right in the few, first few weeks of COVID, uh, even as Highmark Church, we experienced those same apprehensions and wonder of like, hey, is, is, are we going to be okay? Is our people in our church going to be okay? Are they going to lose jobs and work? And I know that was a reality for some people in our church, but I'm thankful that even through the uncertainties, we could cling to the hope and trust that God is in control, that he's doing something uh, great in our lives. And uh, I think this year has just continued as, as a church to renew our commitment to see God work and be the best stewards of what he has blessed us with, that we want to make a difference. And I, I'm happy to say that Highmark Church is in a strong position. Like this year, God has enabled us and uh, we've been able to go to another level and move into this uh, fantastic facility and, and uh, we're blessed to, t- to step into it. So the church is strong. So I, I want you to know we don't talk about money here because we need money more of it or we're desperate or things are bad. Like I'll never be the pastor that's like, hey, things are looking really rough this week. So I better preach a sermon on money. We hit this, this time of year, you know, because we like to get in before uncle Sam starts talking to you about money. We like to talk to you about God's word and his perspective of money because it's valuable. It it helps us understand. So I want to, let me just give you a couple commitments that we have here at Highmark. So you, you say, hey, Don, you're going to talk to me about my money. Let's talk about how the church handles money. And I have a, a few things that ever since we started Highmark Church just a couple years ago, that we have commitments in place of how we're going to handle and steward God's money. So I like to make those clear up front. I like to point to them because I believe uh, it's things that God's laid on our heart and it's part of the difference that we want to make as a church. The first is that 10% of everything that comes in goes to global project, to missions and outreach around the world. So every time that you tithe and you give, every dollar, 10% goes uh, to another ministry or partner that we can make a difference around the world. I love this. We're supporting missionaries in Nepal and Turkey and Guatemala and uh, Thailand, uh, France, uh, Cyprus. We're making a difference every single month by supporting missionaries uh, around the world and partners around the world uh, that we're investing in. And so we practice what we preach, okay? So that's what I'm telling you. As a church, you can have a comfort in knowing that your church is saying, hey, we believe in the idea of being generous, of giving back to the Lord, so much so that we are going to even do it with our church finances. We are going to practice that and give back to the global church and what God is doing around the world. And I love that. I can't wait to see that grow. Uh, That's my favorite thing 
uh, is to be able to support every single month uh, projects that are happening uh, all around the world and missionaries. And, and I can't wait to see that uh, the number of missionaries we support every month just increase as our church finances increase as well. So that's one of our commitments. We have that standard in place. Like this is non-negotiable. 10% goes to global project. I, when it comes to our staffing and salaries, w- this is not a minimum. This is a cap. 35% of our uh, total income can be allocated towards our staffing and our salaries for the team here at the church. The people that are pushing and helping carry the ministry forward and serving our life teams and serving in our kids areas. So uh, we cap that so that we never get out of balance, okay? So we never get things out of whack. We, we have a standard there that we want to make sure that we're allocating the most money for ministry and margin. So ministry and margin, let me talk about those things. The ministry we're doing in, in terms of uh, life groups and uh, outreach and things we're doing as a church, uh, uh, we're, we're funding and helping make those things happen. The margin is money that we say we want to live below our means. Uh, we don't want to live right at the, the, what's coming in. We want to have margin in our budget so that we can seize opportunities when they come along. Let me tell you, that one decision that we created or we put in place since we started the church is really what has helped us in two years catapult into a facility like this. Uh, we've, we've been able to steward the, the finances that you have given so that we can uh, allocate those and, and, prepare, and have this set aside so that we could seize opportunities and we could move in to a facility like this. Uh, and we did raise funds at the end of the year for that, but we've also, from our margin and from our budget, general fund budget, we have funded a lot of what we're doing to furnish and fix up this place to make it home. And so thank you for your faithful giving. I want you to know that's our commitment as a church. There's a couple resources I wanna point you to. And I'm going to have to fly through my message. I'm already like talking way too long. I'm just like fired up today. Uh, but there's a couple resources I want to point you to. Point you to. We do a small group called Financial Peace University. And Dave Ramsey is the guru on all things. And I want you to know, if you need to get your finances in order, you, you don't feel like you're in the healthiest place, you need to get things figured out, you need help with budgeting and stuff like that, uh, financial Peace Group will kick off this Tuesday right here in our facility. It's one of our core life groups that we try to point everyone to go through. And I want to encourage you that if you need to go through it, uh, to, to jump in and do it. Like, just figure it out. It will grow you. It, it'll be a great experience for you. And Tim and Katie uh, Becker, who lead that group, do a phenomenal job. And uh, they practice what they preach as well. They are like the gurus of... Uh, of all things Dave Ramsey. And I, I, here's, I just feel this in this moment. I didn't like plan on doing this. If you're in a place where you say financially it's difficult, financially, um, I, I don't know, because there's a cost for doing Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. Um, I want to tell you, like, we will cover the cost for you to go it. The, the people here at Highmark that tithe and give on a regular basis, they give generously so that we are able to cover that. And we will pay for your uh, subscription and you to go through that course. All you have to do is sign up and we'll cover it. So Tim and Katie, that's news to you. Um, we're covering it. Anybody that wants to go through it, I want to see them uh, not, not have any barriers or things that hold them back from that. And so uh, I, don't, I thank you for our church. Thank you. Let's just give it up for all the people that give faithfully, that we can do things like that. And I, I feel blessed that we're able to, we're able to do that. Uh, you say, hey, I might be all in on giving. I understand giving. Uh, I'm going to share some things today that, I, and uh, this week and next week, that I feel like uh, Pastor Robert Morris, who pastors a church in Texas, he's written a, a couple books. Uh, one is called The Blessed Life. Uh, this is a great resource for you if you just want to grow in generosity, understand more about 
about giving and under, understand more about God's plan in your life. And uh, we'll make sure we get this one out to a table in the lobby. I only have one copy, but we'll give this away today. So if you're interested in this book and you want it today, like I'm just giving stuff away. Like, you know, you don't come to many like financial series and, and some pastor's talking about money and he's giving stuff away, right? It usually works the other way. You're like, man, ooh. Uh, but today, you know, I just wanted to hit those things. I wanted you to know it. Because our perspective of money matters. Sometimes when we think about our finances, it can be stressful. Uh, it can be challenging. I know there's been times in our marriage and in our lives that Jamie and I, it's been stressful to talk about money, to, to kind of figure out how we make it and what the next step looks like and how we're good stewards of what we do have. Um, so sometimes people feel stressed about money. Other times where we kind of like, we're, we have a perspective of money that we're just chasing after it. I want to get more of it. You know, um, I want the dollar bills flying around me and coming at me that I don't know what to do with, uh, with them. I don't understand, uh, you know, we kind of chase after it and, and, you, and we're not really kind of concerned with how it's going out. We're just concerned with how it's coming in and we're, com- we're driving, everything in our life is driving just to get more money and, and do better financially. I think a lot of times our perspective is like, okay, I guess I'm just trying to figure out how to manage this. I'm just trying to figure out how to, how to you know, use this wisely and I'm reading stuff on the internet and this person says to invest in that and this person says to, you know, uh, do this and, uh, and, and we're just trying to navigate what those things are. The, this person saying, hey, you know, buy, uh, you know, AMC stock and it's going to go through the roof or buy this one, you know, like they're just like, just trying to t- give you all the tips and the ways that you're going to, you're going to be successful with it. So I think sometimes we're just trying to figure out what's the best way to manage it. And will I have enough for my future. Um, but I think other times we have a perspective that, listen, we can just kind of go through life and we can say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. I see how God has, has blessed me. And it's not about how fat our wallet is in our bank account, but it's about a perspective that just says, man, I'm grateful for what God has done in my life and I'm blessed. And I'll, I'll tell you, I, a lot of days have those, uh, f- those feelings and thoughts. And it's not when I look at the things that I have, it's when I look at my family and I spend time with my wife and I spend time with my kids and, and uh, I get time to spend with our church. I think like in our, our church family and our, our friends in the church, it's just like those are the things where you just say, oh man, this is what matters. I'm blessed. I'm blessed because of it. And so, but God wants us to kind of have this perspective of money that fits his perspective and his heart. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. And I want to talk about putting first things first, putting things in order in our life. That's really what it comes down to. And specifically, I want to talk about how we honor God with everything in our life. So even beyond our finances, but I feel like finances is one to talk about in terms of honoring God, because it might be the, it could be the most reluctant or the last way that we choose to honor God. You know, we might be a little slower in honoring God with that, but we honor God in other areas of our life. So we're going to look at that today. Uh, this is what Proverbs 3, 9 and 10 says. I love this verse. It's, it's a verse that I come back to uh, in times when I'm just struggling or times when I'm thinking I don't have enough. And it shifts my perspective back to what God's is. And it says this, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. So get this, God is giving us a command first in the first part of this verse. He's saying, listen, honor with your wealth, honor with your money, honor with your income and with the best part of everything you produce. So there's, it's beyond just our wealth. It's beyond just that, that honor should be part of our life. And honoring God is a big part of what he wants to do in us. And I love that he gives us that command, but he doesn't give that command and then it stops there. There's a promise that comes with that command. The promise, it says that then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. 
Now, how many people have barns at home? How many people have vats? You know, not me, but in Jesus' time and in the Old Testament times, it was an agricultural society. So everything that is talked around giving actually tied to what they produced from the land. Our world is more technology-driven. Our, our jobs and our careers are not, uh, n- not as many people are in the agricultural world. So there are a few people that in our church that I know. They have some, some barns and silos that God can fill with grain. Um, but most of us, maybe, we don't understand that. But what God's saying is, I'm going to pour out like a blessing that I'm going to take care of your needs. And I love that. So we can honor the God with our wealth. And I want you to get this this morning. When it comes to honoring God, honoring acknowledges God as our source. It, uh, we're honoring God. When we honor God, we're acknowledging him as our source and our supply. Now, the reason I, I, I always talk, I like to talk about this, is because often we don't look at God as our source and our supply. It's very easy for us to point to our ability and our own talent and how good we are or think of the company that we work for, the job that we have, and we point to that as our source. But if we truly understand that God as the creator of this universe, he has a plan for us, he has a purpose, and he has a will for your life, then we say, I'm living under God's plan and under God's purpose, and I realize that he is directing and ordering my steps every step of the way. So that honoring God then acknowledges that my supply doesn't just come from my company. No, that job is a blessing from the Lord. The career that I've been able to, to walk out and live out and the blessing I've experienced with the company I'm working for isn't just uh, my own doing. It's about the talents that God has gifted me with and the doors that he has opened that are, I am able then to honor him with and I recognize him as my source. And so it's a reminder for us. And in the Old Testament, God gave tons of instruction to Israel. And he said, listen, make sure you give uh, and point back to me that God is the supply. He is the provider. Instead of us saying, I made this money, we say like, God brought this and blessed me with this. And yeah, I worked for it, but I did it as unto the Lord. And it's a blessing from him. And so when we honor God, we are acknowledging him as our source. We're acknowledging him as our everything and, and, and the one that directs us. And in Exodus, he says this, uh, chapter 13, verse 2. He says, God commands the Israelites, dedicate to me every firstborn among the Israelites. He's talking about their, their kids. The first offspring to be born of both humans and animals belongs to me. He's saying, listen, bring your first and bring your best to me. It's a blessing. Actually, last week we were talking about how community counts in our life. And I was talking about the will of God, the call of God in our life. I talked about Samuel as a kid being brought to the temple by his mom, Hannah, because she had prayed for a son desperately. And she brought Hannah and she brought him to the temple. She's following this right here. And she dedicated him to the Lord. She, she left him in the service of the Lord to serve under Eli. And in those moments there, we see that in practice that she literally had prayed for God. She saw him as a source and she brought him, uh, she brought Samuel to serve in the house of God. And ha- God had a big plan for Samuel's life. So we get this remi- these reminders in the Old Testament that the first and the best is what we should bring to God. That's how we honor him. In Leviticus uh, chapter 27, he says it this way, one-tenth of the produce of the land, whether grain from the fields or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord and must be set apart to him as holy. There's a, there's a setting apart. There's a, hey, God has blessed our, our, our harvest. He's blessed us in our income so we can set apart and, and give and, and honor him and acknowledge him as our best. So our, fin- our finances are unique because they show the condition of our heart. They show what God is most concerned with. And that's why the Bible talks so much about this one area because it's what he wants us to do just to trust 
him. He wants us to kind of, uh, our faith to grow. He, he wants us to see his faithfulness along the way, his blessing all the way. So we've got to remember, I think a lot of times we can think about finances and this is the money I'm earning and this is the supply I'm generating. But I'm reminded as I read the full word of God and front back, front cover to back cover, I'm reminded that God's supply is far greater than my supply. His supply is far greater. So like, I don't want to tap into just what I can do. And I don't want my perspective and my view of finances to be limited based on my understanding. I want to tap into God's plan and God's supply for our life. And I love this. I've seen this play out already in the church. I've heard countless stories uh, in our church of God blessing and ordering the steps. One family in our church just this past year, uh, and there's a few stories like this, but one of them uh, just said, you know what, we went all in on tithing uh, for the first time in our, in our family, in our marriage, and uh, we went all in, and they just saw God open up opportunities in their job that were just ridiculous. God blessed them beyond measure, so much so in a year that was super challenging that they were blessed in such a way that they were able to pay off every single debt they had. They were able to tithe on what God had given them more than they had ever tithed ever as a couple. And they, they looked back and they recounted and said, look what God did because we went all in and we were just faithful with the little. They were faithful with the little and God like opened up this blessing. And I love that that's how God works. Like his supply is always going to be greater than ours. So I just want to live a life that I am available and, and, and when God opens up opportunities or blessings that I just want to be in the center of that blessing. God created all of this. And so not only does honoring God show that he's our source, but when we honor, we acknowledge God as our priority. We acknowledge him as our priority. That's why he says, hey, bring the first and we bring our best and, and God instructs us to tithe. That word tithe just means 10%. That 10% of what our harvest is or what our income is should be just, can be set aside for the work of the Lord. So it can be set aside to uh, bring about all God is doing on this earth. And, and so we, bring, uh, we can bring our first and our best and it puts God in the right order in our life. It puts him as a priority in our life. So every, every time Jamie and I get paid and Jamie works outside the church, we are faithful to make sure that before anything that we're, we're committed to giving our tithe. We want to see that money be the first money that's going out of our bank account to bless the church, to, to see God's faithfulness and see God work. And, and we're committed to making that a priority in our, our family and our marriage and and uh, as we give, we just see how generous God is. And so a lot of times we can have possessions as our priority or, or you know, what we're trying to accumulate is, is just our, our priority. But God's saying, listen, understand that uh, I just want to have first chair and first seat in your life. I, wanna, I want you to, not just in the area of finances, but in er every area of your life, I want you to put me as a priority. I want you to grow in this. I have things for you. I, I have things I want to do in your life. And, uh, and so we can, we can see that honor just acknowledges that God is our priority. Look at what Exodus chapter 23, 19 says. It says, as you harvest your crops, bring the very best of the harvest to the house of the Lord your God. I love that he's specific, that he says it's bring your very, very best. Like, don't bring the, think about it, in a harvest, you might have some crops that are damaged. You might, in terms of cattle, you might have like, well, that's the little like weak sheep or the, the sick cow. Let's bring that to the Lord. But no, he's saying like, bring your best. It's a, it's a way to honor God. And I think I just want to build up the honor and honor God in all areas of our life. And I want to bring my best and I want to bring my first to God because that's what he did for us. God sent his only son for us. He sent his, his son so that we could have life and life more abundantly. He sent Jesus so that we could be set free from our sin. Look at what 
John says, John 1, 17, for the law was given through Moses, but God's unfailing love and faithfulness came through Jesus Christ. So God brought his love like he was generous towards us first, that he forgives us of our sins. And if you don't have a relationship with Jesus, let me tell you, God wants to be a, he wants to have a personal relationship with you. He wants to be close with you. He wants his heart and your heart to be closer than maybe they are today. And he says that, his word says that it's through Jesus, his son, that, that brings forgiveness to us, that we are sinners and we are, set, we are separated from God naturally by our sin because God is so holy. But God's grace, he sent Jesus to die on the cross so that our sins for, could be forgiven. And the book of Romans just tells us that all we have to do is we have to ask Jesus for forgiveness and ask him into our life. And we have to acknowledge that, hey, we're, we're broken and we're sinners and we're not perfect. And, and then the God's grace meets us right where we're at. There's nothing about us fixing ourselves up and trying to look better and, and okay, I got to go, I got to get this fixed before I go to church or before I get right with God. The word of God says like Jesus has already done it or, and God has already done it. He extended grace to all of us. And after every service, as we close today, if you've never made that decision, if you're tuning in online or if you're here in person, I want you to know you can make that decision today just by praying a simple prayer. God's grace met us right there, his unfailing love, and he showed generosity to us first, that he uh, has given his first and his best through his only begotten son, his word says, that Jesus came and he gave his life for us. So some people might have objections. Let me talk about some of the objections when it comes to giving and when it comes to tithing. Some people might say, hey, tithe is the law, like that's the Old Testament, and we're in God's grace now. Let me tell you what I see between the Old Testament and New Testament. I don't see any place where grace brings things to a lower level. I see that God's grace and Jesus, when he spoke and he commanded things, he always brought them to another level. He didn't, grace doesn't bring things down, grace brings things to another level. That's what happens. So, you know, uh, the law, we live in God's grace. And Jesus didn't, he didn't say like when, when the law said, don't commit murder, grace doesn't make it now available for us to commit murder. And we can just be like, oh, I can just pray and ask for forgiveness. No, like that's not God's heart. It's not a get out of jail free card. Definitely not a get out of jail free card. So um, please follow that commandment in the, the Old Testament. But when God, the law says, do not murder, but Jesus says, do not be angry at someone. Think about that. Like he elevated it right there. It's not just like, don't act on your anger. He's saying, don't be angry at them. Forgive them. Forgive your enemy. The law said, don't commit adultery. Jesus even elevated it to another level. He said, don't look lustfully at your neighbor's wife. So again, there's a mandate in the Old Testament for saying, hey, don't act on these things. But grace is saying, is elevating things to another level. So the law says that one thing, but Jesus elevated it to generosity. And God's grace elevates our generosity. It should elevate, like God's, our appreciation for what God has done and what he's doing should just elevate to, to another level. And we can, we can see him at work. And I want, I want you to know this, in that argument of like, well, that's law and the New Testament, you know what? Generosity and giving actually existed before God gave the law in Exodus chapter 20. In if you trace back to Adam and you trace back to Abraham, who God spoke directly to, he gave them commands and, and told them to give and give, gener give their firstborn. And he actually called uh, Abraham to sacrifice his first son, Isaac. And, and uh, Abraham had to, he had to have a willing heart. God didn't make him do that, but he took him to the point where he tested his heart in that moment. So grace, it elevates our generosity. It elevates where we're at. So here's the point I want to get at today is I just don't want to lean on my own understanding of finances. I want God's perspective of finances. This week as I was preparing, I saw this 
uh, I read this uh, excerpt from a book called The Psychology of Money. Uh, the guy named Morgan Housel wrote this book, and it's not a faith-based book. It's, it's really just talking about our experience with money. He said this one thing I thought was really interesting, and I guess I didn't put it on the screen, or maybe I put it in a different order. Let me just read it to you. He said this, your personal experience with money makes up probably 0.0000000001% of how the actually the world works with money. Your experience is smaller, but maybe your experience probably makes up 80% of how you think that money works and how you think that the world works. So he's saying your personal experience it probably only makes up like a little piece of how really the world works or, or what could happen. And I think about that because the Bible says that God's ways are higher than our ways. And I think about that differentiation of like sometimes we think we understand how it all works. But reality, we, we only know a little bit of a fraction. There's a bigger perspective. So we all have a perspective. I think of my grandma growing up. My grandma lived in Southern Illinois and we would go visit her and they lived like kind of on, on some farmland and uh, they weren't farmers, but they just kind of retired to some farmland. And I remember that we would go visit her and they had off the back of their kitchen, a huge storeroom. And our family will still talk about this today. My, both my grandparents have already passed away but we'll, we'll remember just that season of where they lived in that house. We had like some great experiences. My grandpa had a big tractor I used to get to ride on and uh, it just a great season growing up as a kid. But I remember off the back of their kitchen, they had a huge storeroom. And on that, there were big wooden plywood shelves and my grandma canned everything she could. Like if she could can it, it was in there and it was ready to go. She had cans and cans of can jars and jars and jars of jars, you know, like to where I'm like, is anybody going to eat pickled beets like that are 10 years old? I don't know if they are. She also in that same room, she had two like big chest freezers, like the, like the probably six, seven foot wide freezers. And they were filled to the complete top with food that was ready to go. And she would often tell, say to my dad, like, hey, if things get bad, if things are difficult, uh, you guys can come here. We have enough food for our family. And what happened is my grandma had lived through the Great Depression. She lived through the Great Depression, and her experience actually had left something imprinted on her that then she operated in a certain way because of her experience. And I think if we don't really break this down and look at God's word and dig in and understand what his heart is behind giving and finances, then we miss out and we, we kind of just depend on our own experience instead of depending on God's experience and depending on what he has for us. And so, listen, we, we need God's grace. We need his help all along the way. And he commands us to give and give generously. That's what Malachi chapter 3 verse 10 says. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. And if you do, say, the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you and I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. And he says, put me to the test. That's the one area God says, listen, put me to the test. I love that. I love that. And you know what? Sometimes we just got to come back to this promise right here. It comes back to trust and believing in God. And this is what it says. It says, and this, the same God who takes care of me will supply all of your needs for his, from his uh, glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. So there we can trust God. We can say, listen, he's going to meet our needs. Giving, tithing, it's a step of faith. It's a step of faith. God calls us. He says, listen, give 10%. There's that quote. See, I just got it out of order. You know, I'm not perfect, okay? A lot of you thought I was, but I'm not. I messed, last week I couldn't turn my mic on, and uh, this week I put my slides out of order. So I'll, t I'll uh, punish myself later for this. But uh, it says, listen, your personal experience with money makes up 0.100%. Um, and I even said it wrong right there. See, I'm definitely not perfect. Um, but here's what I, God calls us. He says, listen, give a tithe. Now, what I want to focus on here as we just wrap up in a moment is that there's often a gap between 
what God's asking us to do and calling us to do and where we're actually at. Sometimes there's a gap where we're just like, I'm not quite there. Let me just identify a few of those things and let me talk about how God closes the gap in each of those situations. See, a lot of times when it comes to giving the 10% and tithing, we have a perspective of, um, you know what? It, we kind of have a self-help mentality. It's like once I get my finances right, then, then I'll give or then I'll be able to do more. And God's saying, listen, there's a, there's a level of trust and, and depending on me. And the reality is that God closes the gap and he says, listen, I'll help you. I'll help you get your finances right. Keep thing, the first things first. Honor me and, and he'll help us do that. So he's not asking us to wait until we get it all figured out. He's saying, listen, just depend on me. Ask for my help. Sometimes we have a fear. We think, oh, I, I, I make so little, I can't. I make so little money. There's no way that I could give. I'm, I'm barely making it. But God meets us and he says, listen, take a step of faith. Test me. Like, that's what Malachi says. Like, the Lord saying, test me in this. And will, it, will I not throw open the blessings of heaven and pour them out? On you, So it is a step of faith that we have to take to get there to tithe. Other times we have pride and we just look back and we say, well, that's a lot of money. And that, what is the church doing with that? And like, I want to know. And I told you our commitments to uh, handling money in a healthy and balanced way and not manipulative. But a lot of times we can say, well, that's a lot of money. And I'm worried about that. And, and we can have almost this pride around money. Like I know how it should be handled or what should happen. But God wants us to be, meet that with humility that he, he closes the gap there and says, listen, just humble yourself before me and, and see what I can do. And I think there's other times we just doubt. We doubt what God can do. I, that can't work. Like, I just can't do the math. Let me tell you, I've been like doing this long enough and giving since I was a teenager and could earn any amount of money that, that my family and my parents taught me to do this. That, and, I, and I've seen God too many times where I'm trying to do the math and I it just doesn't add up. But when I let God do the math, like I doubt it works, but every time he's just asking us to trust him, trust him. And that, that's the bridge he's saying, like, let's a step of faith and get out there. And I think sometimes maybe in a, in a negative, more of a negative light, we have a perspective of greed. Like I want it all, or it's all mine. This is all my money. Like I worked hard for it. And I think God just saying, listen, step into and lean into generosity, see what can happen, see what I can do. But Ultimately, when we honor God, we're placing him first in our life. And when we have that perspective, we're able to honor God in all areas of our life. We're, met, we're able to make a difference in this world and, and uh, be part of his church and see what he can do through us. And that's what God calls us to do. He calls us to be faithful. So we all have that perspective. And I just want you to know, I want God's perspective. I want, I want, his, I want to trust him. And I want to know that he's going to take care of everything that I need. And I, the bottom line today is this, is that when we honor God with everything, we're going to see his blessing in every way. When we honor God with everything and see his blessing in every way, like he is going to do it. If, if we can just trust him, he will see his blessing. It may not just be purely like a, a check shown up in the mail or something like that, but you're going to see the subtle ways that God blesses you in, in your life.